Today's edition of the podcast is brought to you by Coach Me Plus. Coach Me Plus is the leader in athlete management software and a product that I've been lucky enough to be using for a little over a year now. Only rivaled by the impeccable customer service that Kevin and his staff provides, Coach Me Plus's ability to constantly be amoeba-like in their ability to mold and, and matriculate what you're trying to get across and bring together is, is absolutely fantastic. Their constant pursuit of better ways and better methods and, and innovations and progress to their own product is absolutely fantastic. Go over to CoachMePlus.com, check out what they got, guys. It's, uh, it's something that I guarantee you won't be disappointed with. Hello, and welcome to the podcast. Today, guys, we have an absolutely fantastic talk with Stanford basketball sport performance coach Corey Schlesinger. Guys, Corey's going to start out talking about FRC and the role that that plays in his programming, and then we're going to get right into talking about what he's putting out on social media, where the ideas came from, uh, and, and a lot of mentors that have helped build some of the things he's done. He puts out a lot of really great stuff on Instagram. If you don't follow him yet, guys, Make sure you check below in the in the notes and, and start following Corey because he put some really stimulating things out there. Different types of lifts, different type of exercises, fascinating stuff. You know, we get into all of that for quite a bit and then we finish off discussing, you know, his idea of microdosing, where it came from, and not just how it fits into the training program at Stanford, but the overall picture when it comes to basketball. This is an absolutely killer talk, guys. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Let's get right to it. Corey, thanks for being on with us today, man. Hey, pumped. Absolutely pumped, Jay. Yeah, so listen, let's just get right to it. What is getting you fired up out there on the left coast right now? Uh, to be honest with you, um, you know, I, I just came from an FRC certification this summer. That's That gets me pretty pumped up. Um, Big fan of that work, uh, trying to play around with it a little bit. Uh, I was doing a, a pretty bastardized version of it about a year ago and saw you know, some progress. But now actually going to a, a certification and actually learning more and more about the pr uh, principles and how you actually progress it. Um, so it tells me like you can even mess it up and still get something from it. <laughs> so when you see something like that, it's like, man, you know, uh, from a global scale, anybody can apply it. Uh, that gets me pretty pumped up. Um, I mean, as we all know, technologies are, you know, a big thing in our field, uh, connects on that's a technology I'm looking into. It's getting me pretty pumped up. Um, some sweat sensors I'm looking into. Uh, I, I, I'm so lucky here at Stanford to have, uh, my applied sports scientist, Chase Phelps, dude is brilliant. Mm -hmm. He comes from a performance background, which that's why I mess with him. Cause I'm like, dude, this guy actually lifts weights. Like we we're actually training partners. We train together. And so I'm like, okay, this guy understands what it's like to actually have a load on him. <laughs> He's strong. Okay, I can listen to an applied sports scientist like that. Uh, no offense to anybody else out there that's that's not about that life. But I, I, I take more merit to that because obviously that's what I'm about. Um, but, you know, those are things that are getting me excited at the moment. Um, but basically just building a team here. You know, we're going into our second season. We've got some young talent that we're really, really excited about. We got another unbelievably hard non-conference schedule uh, to test our dudes out. Um, but, you know, I love being on the left coast. Um, I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. Um, but more, uh, first and foremost, though, I, I got the best coach in college basketball. Like, no one can convince me otherwise. Um, I get to do my job at the highest level I can possibly do it. And so when you have freedom like that and you have trust, um, it, it really – I mean – to be honest with you, that's what gets me pumped up. That's awesome, dude. And that's, that's, I'm stoked that a Virginia boy can be out there in, in California kicking it. So let's keep going on the FRC stuff. because, uh, And we're going to link your Instagram below here because if people aren't following that, especially your story, um, there's, some, there's some stuff on there that people need to be looking at and, and taking a look and thinking. Like just at least having their mind open and being like, trying to figure out where this is going and where it could lead to. Um, so how does the stuff that Spina talks about fit in with, with kind of your principles and your methods? Well, I think one misconception that a lot of people get is what they see on social media from FRC. You know, they see these crazy uh, 
movement patterns that are like freaks of nature are doing. And to be honest with you, that's not what FRC is about. Um, basically, it's just about uh, bringing more or greater degrees of freedom to joints, right? And it's basically, it, it's, it's uh, off of mostly uh, isometric research. And so what I like about it is it's coming from a strength conditioning uh, base has been proven time and time again. All they're doing is finding a really creative way of increasing uh, ranges of motion through tension and stability, and uh, it works immediately. Like that's the one thing I'm just like. You can take a guy who has terrible squatting depth, if you will. You can apply a couple of things, um, and as long as the intent and the drive is there, you're going to see immediate um, progress. And so that's the one thing for me. I'm like, man. It's like almost like a like a like a parlor trick, you know. Like I can get guys to buy in, basically. Like, hey man, you got bad hip mobility. Let's do this. Let's do that. And then boom! Oh wow! Look, man, look how much squat depth you got now, based on what you just came in ten minutes ago. Now that's not the goal. We don't want to use it for a trick. We want to use it for actual adaptations. But uh, that's where I've been using it from. Um, and just mainly, I just stick with lower leg complex, a lot of foot, ankle, um, and then some shoulders. Foot, ankle, shoulder, and then we'll finish with some hip. Um, but, you know, the basic areas that we all think, oh, man, we probably need to be more stable or more mobile. Um, and so it's just owning those ranges of motion. But uh, it's hard. Like a lot. Hey, dude, to really apply that, the intent, I mean, it is taxing on the body. Like you will be sore, incredibly sore um, after your first real session of it if you do it the right way. Um, so it's just being smart about how you apply it just like anything else. But, you know, that gets me pretty pumped up about, um, how we're applying it now. We just use this part of the warm up. um, start with our ankle complex, um, and then basically move up the chain from there. So you said you were kind of doing a ripoff version of it prior. Yeah. What did you learn from the class that you were like, Oh, shouldn't have been oh, doing what- it this way. Right. I skipped all the steps. I, I went right into cars. So I went into all the cool motions that you see with the hips, uh, where everybody's like stepping up and over things and they're creating a radiation to, you know, create trunk stability. So that'll allow you to get more hip mobility. And we were going right into that cool stuff. Um, and you know, it's, you got to step back a lot more and do a lot more of the ISO work first. Um, and then that's where I made my biggest mistake, but at the same time it worked. Like there was benefit from it. I mean, I had a guy who had a uh, voluntary sh- uh, shoulder surgery this past uh, summer, and that's what we stuck with. We're like, okay, hey, you know what? We're gonna we're gonna re-engineer your lower body. Like that was the goal. We're gonna re-engineer the lower body, how you load, how you move, how you absorb force, and more importantly, how you create the force. And from that point, we were just messing around with this, and he was like, man, I, my joints feel good. I feel lower. I feel smoother in my transitions. And I was like, man, we're just, and once again, I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm just doing it based off the stuff I saw from social media. And it just made sense, you know, and it was a way. Now I had that specific uh, moment where we could actually do it, you know, like, Hey, look, and I ain't got to worry about basketball. Cool, man. So like, we got a lot of one-on-one time. We got a lot of time together. So we're tinkering. I mean, it's, it's straight lab time. We're just playing around and experimenting. And he had a lot of success from it. So then obviously going back, learning about, okay, you probably need to do the pails and rails and all this stuff first. Um, that's what made it a lot more successful uh, for me as far as how I'm going to apply in a team setting. No, that's awesome. And I think that what's, what's really cool about that is everybody likes to talk about all the sexy, neat, and cool things. But it turns out the mundane, simple stuff is what seems to work the best. Oh, 100 percent. I mean, I, I come from like an easy strength philosophy. Like, I'm piggybacking off of Dan John. Like, it, it's as it, like I want to keep my stuff as easy and as simple as possible. Now, if you see the stuff on on my stories, like it's looking like we're doing some pretty crazy stuff. But keep in mind, like we train and we train very often. So that's obviously mastering very simple things: uh, swings, pulls, squats. You know, like our guys are owning that stuff. It's just mainly uh, just trying to create some derivatives from that just to make it more engaging, to be honest with you. So let's talk about your story a bit. Yeah. Where's the stuff coming from? What, what is spinning in Corey's head? Oh, man. Uh, I'll be honest with you. It's, uh, it's me and whoever's around me at that moment of time. So you know, I have a lot of people visit me, and I'm very fortunate to be in an area like the Bay where there's a lot of bright minds and there's a lot of people traveling in and out. 
And so, um, you know, people just drop by and basically we're like, okay, you want to train together? Yeah, awesome. Uh, so what are we doing today? Well, let's play around with this implement. And then from that point, it goes from, all right, we're doing this, and then we're experimenting with that. And we just keep building and building and building. And it's like, well, okay, this makes sense for this. And it all starts with a problem. Like, what? what okay, my problem is I love the Olympic lifts. You know, I'm a, I'm a big snatch clean jerk guy, okay? But over time, I'm learning. <laughs> like maybe that's not necessarily the night. No, 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 that's my big, from, big bang for my buck. It's what I love to do. But maybe over time, you know, getting that extra 10 kilos on that clean or on that snatch, is it really worth it? I don't know, right? And we can speed up the bar. We can do some other things and wave. But, you know, what if we just gave them a new skill set? And let's give them a movement pattern that's, you know, slightly a derivative of it. But, you know, we're just almost like we're uh, we're building more uh, gr- or greater degrees of freedom, very similar to FRC, right? Um, and so just giving them a more of a skill set, because let's just be honest, our basketball players, they have one or two decent qualities, but as far as being a real athlete, they are terrible, real athletes, put them in any other situation outside of basketball. They are terrible athletes. So at the end of the day, I'm just, Hey, it's more motor coordination. They're learning new movement patterns. Um, and so I'm giving them greater degrees of freedom so that they can, you know, take whatever's given to them. You know, I'm basically, I'm a resilient coach first. Okay. I'm a human performance coach. I'm not a basketball performance coach. And I think that's where a lot of people get messed up in our field is they, okay, well, we want their, we want their jumps high. Do we? Like, jumps are important. Don't get me wrong. Right. But whatever forces they're creating, I care more about how they're absorbing that shit. Sorry about the cuss word. But, I mean, I want them to own whatever they already got before we start building a bigger engine in them. And a lot of us get lost in that, okay, we need this adaptation or we're doing this, uh, this type of movement pattern so that we can elicit this response or bands and chains or whatever you want to do. Don't get me wrong. That stuff's cool. I like it. I'm, I'm all about it too. But, I mean, there's a lot, of, lot to be said about just having a lot of variety and variability in your movement patterns that is joint and ligament. Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, integrity, you know, that's just like being able to take whatever forces that they're placed upon them and whatever freaky situations they get on the court. And that's why you see us a lot in the wrestling room. And that's why we're rolling around, tumbling, doing all that crazy stuff. I mean, probably everybody's sick and tired of me here uh, talking about that, but that's the foundation of just human movement. And so if you look at, you know, my pyramid, if you will, the very first rung, yeah, foundational strength, but it's just being better humans first. It's very cobblestone training, like Vern Gambetta talks about. It's just a lot of different stuff because at the end of the day, like I said earlier, you can do you can throw a kid in the pool or you can do cartwheels, and the next thing you know, their squat numbers go up. Why? Because it's just about exposure. And so if I expose them to many different facets of just being a better athlete, well, hopefully being a better athlete will make you a better basketball player, not necessarily making you a better basketball performer be a better basketball player. I think you'll wreck the car a lot faster. If that makes sense. No, hundred percent. Because all you're going to do is keep turning left, 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 and now now you don't have a right tire. Oh man, love that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So let's. I, I don't care if people are sick of it or not. I I love hearing about this stuff. So let's go to the yeah. wrestling room, because yeah. there's you put and and now it was outside in the summer too. Don't think I don't watch those videos, <laughs> where you do a lot of that stuff with the guys. Let's get into. You know, where that came from, because you said Dan John, but I think you're going to stay on the East Coast with some of this. Yeah. So, uh, man, a, a real brilliant mind. That a lot. Of, I mean, I'll tell you. He, so his name's Ethan Reed. Let's go ahead and get that out there. He used to be a Wake Forest. Um, this man, he's a physical educator first. Right. I mean, this is the guy I would love to have had P.E. class with him growing up. And I wish he would be a. Uh, uh, a uh, uh, superintendent of physical education for America for right now, because I'm telling you, like he comes from a wrestling background, but he comes from obviously way back where people were actually like general population were athletes. <laughs> general population was kind of lean, you know, general population could climb across monkey bars. You know, he comes from that era. And so basically my first internship or my first exposure to strength and conditioning was through him. And when I saw 300 pound linemen doing cartwheels and somersaults and tumbling on the ground, I was baffled. I'm like, why are they, why are they doing this? Why are they doing this shit? E? And 
<laughs> he's like, Corey, they fall every single play, don't they? Yeah. Well, don't you think it's a good idea that they know how to fall properly and they're very comfortable in those transitions? Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> then I go out to the field turf and I'm like, secretly, because I didn't want nobody to see me do it. So I go to the turf. I'm like, man, I can do this shit. And I'm telling you, like, I'm spinning. I, my, my head is, I, I'm getting headaches. I'm dizzy. And I'm like, man. And so you look into it a little bit more, vestibular system. I mean, you can go really, really deep in just the simple calisthenics and tumbling and forward crawl, like all, all that type of stuff, just changing, getting your head below your feet. Like It's amazing how many great things that you can get out of just forward and backward rolling. And it, it, it's just awareness of the body and where you are in space. And, and it's, a, it's just so easy. People just look over it so quick. And... Um, but yeah, basically it's going back to that being human aspect. And so that's where, yeah, it came from Ethan Reeve really. Um, and that's what really expanded my, or started my pro or my evolution of doing a lot of this stuff. Um, the, the next step was when I came out here to Stanford, I met this brilliant, or we have this brilliant gentleman, his name's Aton Gilbert. Okay. A lot of people probably don't know about him in the performance world, but he's uh, he's an ATC um, by trade. But this guy is basically he is the Renaissance man. Okay, like, he is brilliant in every discipline you can possibly imagine. But um, he's always in the wrestling room, right? And he uh, when I first met him, I had a friend on the East Coast recommend just talking to him, and so. Basically, in our first five minutes of conversation uh, or conversing, he's like, come on down to the wrestling room. We're going to roll around. I'm like, okay. So we go down to the wrestling room, and he's just pulling and tugging, and he's showing me all these great training drills, like partner training drills. And I'm sitting like, oh, man, I can see direct application with my guys for this. Like, this would be so good for my guys. And so I stole so much stuff from him and his uh, uh, judo background where I use it a lot with my guys now. You know, and, and, and I will always use it. I mean, it's to me, that goes back to just being a better human, tugging, pulling, pushing, grabbing, rolling, you know, they, all these things just being better humans. And so uh, it got to evolve to what you probably see now in those stories. And it's a lot. I give a lot of credit to that man for helping me with that with that evolution. No, and it's awesome stuff, man. And it's great to look at because, you know, the one thing that we've started looking at and talking about more is more of the isometric holds with our young guys. Mm -hmm. and crawling progressions to make sure that they are able to hold and get in positions. I mean, whatever cool terms we want to use now with it. Uh, but quick fun fact, did you uh, know that Ethan Reeve was the first person ever to present at the seminar? No, I did not know that. Yep, he was no number one in 2011. Yep. Uh, well, you, you picked a good one. Yeah. You picked a good one because uh, he, I'm, I, owe, I owe a lot to that man. Uh, uh, quick Another fun fact, uh, he asked me to paint his room because he knew uh, I, I couldn't get money, right? It was a volunteer internship, so he's trying to help me out. He's like, Corey, why don't you come paint my guest bedroom? I'll pay you 100 bucks. I'm like, okay, you painted before. Yeah, yeah, coach, I paid before. I go in there and wreck the shit out of it. Like, it was paint all over the carpet. I've never painted anything in my life, but he let me do it, and he was so cool. He's like, here you go, Corey. Kind of great job, and just let it be. And I knew it was a shit job, and I went into work the next day, and everybody's laughing at me. And, but he was still so cool about it. Uh, <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> He's a good dude. Yes. Yeah. The one thing, a hundred percent certain, without hesitation. He's fantastic. Yeah. He's a good. You don't. You don't see many of his quality out there. No. No. Not at all. Well, then let's keep going with the story because there's some other things that you do there. You do yeah. a lot of stuff of late. There's been a lot of stuff that looks like it's like landmine based. Yeah, yeah. We, we've been playing with the landmines, uh, just trying to find really creative ways. Uh, basically, power is power. Force is force. Um, it might just be because of I get bored. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. Love the cleans. Love the snatches. Love the swings. But man, I can't keep watching that. I, I just can't. Like, don't worry, I, I'm a fan of it. I love seeing like heavy cleans and, and and great swings. But you know, it's all it's all sagittal. Like, is there other ways that we can just create force for creating force sake and being able to just and just once again going off of, of a sound principle and just being and just high movement quality. And so yeah, I've been that's been my big kick lately is trying to find different ways of creating force. 
and just and, and mainly it's regressions to Olympic variations, if you will. And it's not to say that the like the Olympic lifts aren't enough. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying like with a multidisciplinary athlete, maybe we can just play around with some different stuff. And hey, I'm just trying to create a movement library that, and it goes to kind of how we train. We can talk about that after this with our microdosing, but. I want to give them the, the authority to say, hey, man, I want to do that movement today. I like that variation we did because if they have a, a, a movement that they can do very confidently, very heavy and very fast, shit, I want them to do that movement. You know, like I don't want to – if they're not confident in, in straight up cleans, well, I don't want to force that down their throat. I want them to have a lot of autonomy on their own training and say, hey, man, if this is the movement you feel like gets you awesome, let's get awesome at it then and let's just stick with that. And so basically, I'm just trying to give them as many, uh, many opportunities to have say in their training and to give them a movement library that's so large that they're like, yeah, that's cool. And it's not that we just, we just do movements for movement's sake. I mean, we all start with shoving down your throat, basic movement, movement patterns. And, but, you know, with this group out here especially, we fast cook them. Like, I'm usually a slow cook guy, but with these guys, like, intent – and their ability to pay attention and their and just their motivation alone, like it's it's a very special group that we're past all that. Like we've we've done it, and I just don't want to keep beating a dead horse. So you know they're really sharp kids. If I give them the intent of what they need to do and what they need to feel, then they can do some really special things because number one, the intent is there, um, and they can conceptualize what I'm talking about. Um, so it's a really easy transition as far as coaching these guys. And it's a different athlete. But, um, yeah, you see uh, uh, the center mass bells. That's another implement Ooh. that I'm a huge fan of. Um, it's endless. The, the things that you can do with that implement is just absolutely endless. Uh, the landmine variations, yeah, we, you know, going from a, a rotational aspect or some uh, – just basically I'm just trying to get out of the sagittal plane because we, we live there. You know, that's where we build our big engine. I get that. But – you know, if I can find some ways to, to tinker the engine a little bit more through what they actually do in sport, yeah, let's do that. You know, uh, I wish that guys just ran straight and jumped straight up and down. <laughs> That'd be a really nice, nice area to work in because then you can do some special things. But with our guys, we all we know that's not true. No, no, not at all. It's sometimes it's hard enough to get them to walk straight, let alone run straight. So, <laughs> that was a topic for another day. But yes. <laughs> A hundred percent. So let's keep rolling right into it, man. Let's talk about yeah. microdosing and how you guys are training and what you're building and, and, and let's rock out there. Yeah. Uh, so basically microdosing and it's funny, like Derek Hansen had a, uh, I think he had a podcast a week after I talked about it with, uh, or at the final four and I'm sitting there like, man, everybody's going to think I jacked this from Derek because <laughs> he's such a sharp dude. And I'm like, you know, well, you know what? He's a really sharp dude and a lot of people respect him. Yeah, sure. I, I can steal it from them, but I'll take credit for that. But uh, basically, I just wanted to start a culture here at Stanford that iron is important. And if it's important enough to do um, or if it's if basketball is important enough to do every day, lifting is also important enough to do every day. So it really started more from a culture standpoint. And I didn't want to just beat these guys down with weights. And like through a three to four day period. And then once we get in season, it's one to three. If you're lucky, maybe one to two. I love how strength coaches say, yeah, yeah, we train three times a week in season. In reality, they don't. You know, they foam roll for a session, call it a session. But I'm like, no, no, no. We, we, we actually put our hands on bars or bells and we lift every single day. And we were in February um, and we lifted six times one week because that's how our schedule is set up. Now, once again, the microdosing, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's small amounts of training. It's mainly like a 20 to 30 minute lift at most. Um, but basically, I just want them to get awesome at one movement a day. Show me what you got that day. Get in, get out. And that's where it started. Mm. Uh, also, it also started with my coach because I asked him, like, what's the one thing you hate seeing me do, coach? And he's like, warming up the guys. <laughs> I'm like, coach, what's the one thing you think I hate doing? Warming up the guys. <laughs> Coach, what do you think the kids hate the most out of practice? Warm-ups. Okay, great. Let's find a way to get rid of warm-ups. How are we going to do that? Okay, how about we lift every day? You know, and, and I had spun it like, oh, toughness and blah, blah, blah. And they're like, oh, yeah, sure, man. Yeah, we, we lift every day. I'm like, okay, that's not really the purpose behind it. But it got rid of warm-ups. So now the guys come in 
they get their shakes or whatever. Uh, we hit our, uh, our general warm up takes anywhere between three to five minutes. That's on them. I put the ownership of that one on them. So you guys got three to four minutes to figure it out. Okay. You see the movement of the day, uh, or the prescribed category, if you will. So if it's a hip flexion movement, I give them some autonomy to say, Hey, what kind of squat you want to do today? Um, then we go into a more specific warm up through our A series. So it's anywhere between one to four different exercises uh, in a circuit like fashion, which is going to prepare them for that lift. And then we hit our big bang lift, you know, rather it's a clean, uh, uh, a deadlift, a pull, a press, whatever. Um, we hit that movement. We just get awesome at it. Put about 10 to 12 minutes on the clock. Once it gets to that point, you work up to your awesome weight, and then we'll see where you got to today. Uh, basically, I built the world's biggest PR board. Uh, but I did it via electronic, obviously. Uh, so it's on an Excel spreadsheet. I hit their tab, and I have every exercise that I think is worth tracking in each category. So you got your hip flexion, hip extension, strength variations, uh, power variations, or power, whatever that means. Um, and then basically from there, I can kind of map out or radar radar map what movements they're really good at and they like doing, what movements they're not really that strong at, and why? And then ask deeper questions like, why don't they like doing this movement? Well, maybe they don't like doing it. Or maybe it's just like a structural thing. Um, so now I can almost radar data and just see like, man, the guy this stature and this size really likes these movements. The guy this stature and that size and that skill set really likes this movement. And then it allows me to ask deeper and deeper questions. So you know what? He changes direction really, really well. And he does these movements really, really well. This guy really sucks at these movements, and he really sucks at this on the court. huh? So you can start asking deeper and deeper questions about, hey, how can we expand that movement library to pick up the weaknesses, if you will, but always keeping those strengths strong? Um, and then basically give them the autonomy because at the end of the day, it's neck up. If they feel like they're getting awesome at that movement, then they are getting awesome at that movement, and they're getting their quote-unquote progressing. But anyways, back to the microdosing. So. As far, um, as far away from competition is obviously going to be our most structurally and uh, stressful uh, or structurally damaging and stressful to the body. Um, but that's also the hardest practice day. So when we look at stress holistically, our big stress days are going to be big stress days in the weight room and big stress days in practice. Have you ever heard the where people go, oh, man, it's a really hard practice, so we got to be light in the weight room. Or it's a really light day in practice, so we got to go really, really heavy in the weight room. Yeah. Well, at the end of the day, stress is chronically high mm -hmm. so good luck guys you know like now now everybody's staying high right so that's our way of waving it and so now we, when we program practice we're like okay hey we know today's going to be a heavy day okay so now i can go back to the weight room and say okay more likely we're squatting or pulling today cool um and then of course there's a lot of uh, areas for exceptions we all know that but um as we get closer and then it's specifically on game day obviously it's very elastic and reactive uh, maybe it's like dumbbell snatch, kettlebell swing, barbell squat jumps, something that's a little bit more elementary. Uh, but you can, I mean, the intent is to drive and very reactive and, and something that they're very, very confident in that they can just absolutely rip. And we'll hit that about four to five hours before the game. Um, and then that'll lead right into shoot around, which will lead right, right into a pregame meal. And so basically that's how we, that's how we do it. Um, Trying to think anything else specific about that. How do you um, do that on the road? How do you up? do that on the road? So the, the lifting. Great question. Uh, we don't. Because Ooh. the one thing I look at is we train so much, it's okay if we don't train on the road. You know, a lot of people are always trying to find crazy ways to train on the road. Well, how about you just train more at home? <laughs> you know, so maybe you don't have to train on the road. You know, and especially if you're charter, you're not really on the road that long. No. And so. Yeah, that's the real benefit about chartering. So, you know, at that point, then, yeah, why even worry about it? Now, I'll take some guys, special case scenarios, or, um, you know, if you got a guy who's maybe not playing a lot of minutes, hey, dude, let's, we're, get, we're getting awesome today. You have no say in this. You know, if you're not going to play a lot of minutes or you don't play any minutes at all, we're getting awesome on game day, you know. Uh, but yeah, that's how I really handle it on the road. We just don't do it. So it's their uh, D load, if you will, whatever, yeah. whatever term you want to use. But yeah, so that's where I was saying, like when we're at home, we have, you know, play Thursday, Saturday. Yeah, we lift Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Then we come back, we lift Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, play Thursday, uh, off Friday, play Saturday. And then we're back at it again, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So 
you know, we're tra uh, training is still high. Like we are still training. Uh, our, our volume of training is still extremely high. Um, but once again, that microdosing and it allows, I look at it like this too. If you're only getting awesome at one movement a day, like for instance, Jay, you're going in and you're deadlifting the world today, but that's the only thing you got to do. I'm pretty sure you could go play basketball right after that, right? Mm -hmm. Cool. Then you come in the next day. Are you really going to be that shot? Probably not. So you know what? Hey, we're squatting today. Cool. Oh, now we're getting closer to game. Okay, so we're about two days away from the game or maybe a, a day before the game. Hey, we're going to clean today. Awesome. Just rip out a, the heaviest clean you can. Now, with that being said, that PR board we were talking about earlier, I just look at their best numbers at it, their best quality numbers. That's probably the best way to put it. If they had a, a, a crappy rep, then I'm not going to chart that guy. But basically, I just give them a PR, and I'm like, oh, okay, last time you hit that clean from two blocks or whatever – uh, you hit 100 kilos for a single. Today we're going on singles. So you know that in your head. You got 200 kilos. Work up to it. Be a responsible human being and get it done. Cool. And that's basically all I do. So um, from a coaching standpoint, it's a lot of fun because you're making uh, arrangements on the spot. And it, that that's the part that I love the most is it feels like you're almost in like – you've ever seen like the stock market? Mm -hmm. Like you see everybody crazy and going like, that's my favorite part like it's not calm it's not cool no it's everybody like you 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 uh 10 kilo jump 20 kilo jump whatever and you just run around like crazy but it's very individualized on that day for that particular athlete on that particular movement before practice like cool and that's what i like about it because it's just basically rpe mm -hmm. that would be my rpe for the day yeah man this guy was like 30 kilos off his best what the hell happened today you know and that lets me know where they're at oh man they just they stroked out a PR. Like, how did they pull that off? And it's, I don't want to miss opportunities for guys getting awesome. And that's why we don't do a lot of, uh, of uh, what's it called, percentage-based programming because I'm not going to keep a guy at 80% if he's getting awesome at 90 and 95% and feeling good that day. Shit, let it rip, man. Uh, I'm not going to miss those opportunities because especially in season, you don't get those opportunities very often. Ooh. So I ain't going to waste them. No. You know? Um, but of course we have a lot of technologies, you know, I mean, we use Omega wave, we use all these other things to, to help, uh, monitor stress and to make sure that, Hey, look, I'm not cooking them so much in the, in the train or in training or in practice. So, you know, we're doing our due diligence, but I mean, basically though, at the end of the day, yeah, you know, we lift weights and we lift weights often and yeah, we're kind of proud of it. So then after they hit their big lift, yep. do you basically say room's yours? If you're if you're done, you're done. If you want to go freaking cook your guns, you can go do that. Or basically, this is what we'll do for that. So when they're done, they're done with their big big bang movement. Then they go get taped. Then they go get some individual shots or individual skill work with their position coach, and then we go right into practice. Now, if you guys want to do some you know fun day gun day, or you guys want to do get awesome, I want you to get awesome after practice, okay? Because hey, that stuff's not important to me. Now, um, days that were um, We'll do some like one by twenties or one by fifteen circuit like stuff um, in between games, mainly just for blood flow, mm -hmm. right? For generation purposes. So that's where we get a lot of our quote unquote volume work in. But I mean, we do. I mean, if you train that often, that's a, a, a lot of volume in itself, especially in your A series. Like when we're hitting. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. The, um, so you hit your A series, then B is our complex. Complex is life in our program. Um, I give all credit to Jonas Serration at UNC for, for that. But we do complex every day, whether it's in the form of barbell with, through a clean and snatch, uh, dumbbell, or center mass bell or kettlebell. So there's going to be a complex to prepare you more for whatever that specific movement is. So if we're doing cleans, obviously we're doing a clean complex. Um, snatch is snatch complex. Uh, barbell squat jumps, I let them choose. Well, hey, what complex you feel gets you ready? Some guys just grab the kettlebell and start hitting five RDLs, ten swings, eight squats, five rows, and a carry. Cool. And then, uh, yeah, that's about it, really. That's rad. It's fun. I mean, it, and that's the one thing I really like about it. I, I think it gives me more purpose, and I'm not trying to just own like tear the shreds of program just so I can feel important. But it gives me purpose every single day I come into work because. Yo, we are training every single day. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm not just the physiotherapy guy saying, oh, we're stretching today. And we're, yeah. And then I go and just sit in the back and watch practice. Like, nah, man. Like, we, I'm very active every day. And it's my readiness testing. And don't get me wrong, guys come in sometimes. And that's when you have to have that relationship. And it's like, yo, my man, 
you don't look too good today. <laughs> you walk in, your head's hanging, you're usually talking to me, you're usually cracking jokes. Hey, man, just go get some shots up. Get your body right, go get some shots up, call it a day, you know, or whatever Omega Wave readings might you read. But, you know, that's where if you train so often, it's okay to have off days or it's okay to get, you know, hey, you ain't training today, bro. Like, it's okay to have that because our training volume is so high. Yeah, no, I, I, I love that, man, especially with, like, if you get into a year that you're on, like, a foreign trip, mm -hmm. I mean, bro, you're talking, like, 11 and a half months straight, like, these cats are going. Oh, 100%. So if you can keep it simple and quick and, and still get it done, mm -hmm. yeah, man. I'm now, in our off-season, yeah, that's, man, that's just out the window. <laughs> off-season... Yeah, we, we, <laughs> yeah it, it's my show. You know, we, we are training for a long duration. <laughs> we're outside for almost an hour in the wrestling room, and then we're in the weight room for almost an hour. Um, but you know, that's where that capacity gets so high in our off season mm -hmm. that, man, that, that's nothing. Like, handling that is nothing. Um, I think there's one more point I was going to make about it. Um, if it comes to me, I'll, I'll bring it back up. But um, yeah, ba basically, it's oh, that's what it was. So year one, microdosing. Moving into year two, my really, really well trained guys, and year three, and hopefully year four and five and six, and hopefully I'm here forever. That'd be great. But you know, as they mature and as they become better trained, obviously we're not going to train as often because I don't have to tap that tank anymore. They're very, very well trained. Um, if we're training, we are really training for an adaptation. And, we're, and we'll be spreading that stimulus out even further. So you might only train two to three times a week, maybe one to two times a week. It, basically, at that point, you are, pro, you are a pro in our program. You're kind of telling me what to do, really, more so than me telling you what to do. Because, And that's what we, we do. We, we really create this culture of ownership and autonomy to where, I mean, these guys really are educated on what I'm trying to get done. And how how I uh, and how we do our training sessions, it's more of education set, uh, sessions as well. So they're basically telling me what they feel is good and what they don't feel is good. I, I, and that brings me up to another point. Once again, I told you, Jay, I was going to digress. Um, so we all care about these metrics and like, hey, man, I hit this weight at this speed or whatever. But for me, I'm I'm more asking, like, I'm not even looking at the weight on the bar. I'm like, hey, how did that make you feel? Where did you feel that? Did you feel poppy? Uh, do you like that? Do you not like that? Um, and then it even goes to the questions, hey, man, when's the last time you cried? <laughs> it even gets to that type of stuff because I want to know what's going on upstairs. you know. And, and having that type of conversation with your athlete, I mean, it, it, training is so much deeper than sets and reps and metrics. It, it really is. And that's probably like the more uh, frou-frou side of me is like, or the yogi side, or whatever you want to call it, Yoda, is, uh, man, it's so much neck up, and how we feel when we train, like, uh, man, I want you to feel like you are getting something out of this, other than, yo, man, I gained 20 pounds in my freshman year, yeah, no shit, because you were, you know, you were raised on, you know, government cheese, more than likely, and you now getting good food for the first time, and you're training for the first time. So when I see these transformation pics all the time on Instagram or whatever, I'm just like, dude, yeah, no shit. They should be gaining weight, getting stronger, whatever. Who cares about those metrics? I want to see those metrics their senior year. Yeah, I want to see that shit. I want to see 10-pound gains during that time. Um, then I'll call you a bodybuilding coach. But anyways, once again, <laughs> like I told you, Jay, I was going to digress. Uh, but the performance metrics, don't get me wrong, they're important. But I think as we all know, the number one performance metric is wins. <laughs> the number two is players available. And that's what really, really matters. So when we train, we are training to be available. We are not training to display athletes to say, hey, man, my, well, I got six guys who clean 225. Like, who gives a shit? Like, does it mean nothing? In the grand scheme, it means nothing. And so when we train, we train just to be better humans. We train to feel like we are getting bigger, faster, stronger, if you want to say that. And we train to just, to be honest with you, to be available. That's really what we train for. Now, if we're doing combine testing, that's a totally different thing. Like, hey, man, I got to get you jumping high. I got to get you all this and all that. Great. But to me, those performance metrics, and I think they're for the birds, man. <laughs> now, you need something to keep you on track. Don't get me wrong. You, but I always look at it like this. You got to keep the needle moving right. 
as long as the needle is moving right, you're good. Now, if you have some performance metrics that are moving left, then you got to start asking questions about your programming or how the kid is and, and things like that. But I'm not looking for these peaks and valleys of, of periodization. Because that doesn't exist in college basketball. There is no such thing as periodization. It's we play eight months out of the year. So what are you peaking for? Eight months out of the year? Like good luck with that. Um, yeah. So yeah. So mainly what you're trying to quote unquote peak for is to be the strongest, the fastest, and the most durable at the end of the season. So what's beautiful about microdosing is training is always present. So when it's always present, and then you start t- uh, taking back practice, January, February, March, right? Then there's more gas in the tank for what? Training. For training. Hey, there you go, right? So now, oh my God, we're setting PRs in February and March. So that means we're, quote unquote, stronger and faster at the end of season when you want to win championships. What a concept, right? <laughs> and so that's where I think microdosing is great because it keeps training present all the time. And when you want to put gas on the gas pedal, it's not going to crush a kid. They're going to be able to adapt from it and recover and still perform, at least in my eyes. Now, once again, I'm all theory. You know, I'm not running these crazy uh, research projects and having, you know, the, uh, or we're in a, in a lab proving this stuff. I know what I see. I see PRs. I see quality movement patterns, and they're sound. And guys are available. So as long as we keep that going, I think we're going to be okay. <laughs> I think we're going to be more successful than not. Yep. Sorry for the rant. That was no. Wrong. <laughs> you know what? That that was awesome. And I think that uh, people better hit that rewind button about 45 times to go back through all that because there was a lot of freaking big time stuff in in, in that rant. And it's uh, I can't thank you enough, bro, for being that candid because that's, that's awesome. I, I really appreciate it. Well, no worries. I had, I had a, a very, uh, I won't mention his name, but I had a, a guy that I really respect a lot uh, come train with me a few months or a month ago. And when we were talking, he I told he, he asked me like, okay, what kind of model are you running or what kind of periodization are you doing? And I was like, I- I'll be honest with you. It's, it's right behind you. And he turns around. It's just a whiteboard. And it was a whiteboard and it had initials on one side and it had reps above and it had movement pattern or uh, movements that we were quote unquote charting. And that was it. That was our programming. That was what we viewed as, okay, that's progression. Cause we just keep, we kept it that simple. But um, I mean, mainly it's just like these things, these things that we think matter. I, I, I question it because there is no, I, I still have not found yet direct correlations to certain performance metrics and basketball success. I still haven't seen it yet. Um, and so until I start seeing, you know, squat numbers equating to field goal percentage, then uh, when I see that, then, then, okay, you know, maybe, maybe I need to start uh, uh, switching my tone or my, uh, my tune. But until then, you know, at the end of the day, if you're a sound human being and you are bigger, faster, stronger, or bigger, whatever, but stronger and faster than you were a day ago or a week ago or a month ago and a year ago, you're going to be pretty good. You're going to be pretty good. But anyways, yeah. No. <laughs> you know, that's a hard thing to admit because everybody's like, oh, man, we, we do this and we do that. And we're, we're under this model or we're under this system. And it's like, man, uh, systems put you in a box. Yup. And that's the one thing. Like, If you're in a box, you are limited by the box. And a lot of people are like, oh, we're out of the box thinking. No, you're still in a box. <laughs> like, if you follow this specific thing, that's a box. Now, it's okay to follow sound principles, but you know, if there is no box, then it's unlimited on what you can do. And so that's how I look at it. Yeah. No, and that is an absolutely killer point to leave it at, bro. That was this is a killer 45 minutes, man. I can't thank you enough. This is awesome. Hey, no worries, man. I, ho- I hope it's worth it for everybody out there because once again, like. I, pr- I might get some naysayer, like a lot of like, ooh, he, he, I don't know what he's doing. <laughs> and you're probably right, yeah, me neither. But it's, I, I hope it's, I hope it rings a bell for a couple of people. And uh, and once again, Jay, like what you do is amazing, and what you pr- provide for our profession is, is, is bar none to anything else. Your your conferences, I've been to uh, the one I went to. Um, I'll be honest with you, I was scared. I, I was scared. I've never been scared to go to a conference, but I was scared because I was intimidated by so many brilliant people there. 
And then that's why I like, well, Jay might not be that smart because he had me on his podcast. So that's why I was like, I don't, I don't know, man. Like there's some really brilliant people that you bring and it's amazing what, how you bring these people in and the information that they can share. I, I, I'm just, I'm blown away that I'm actually uh, talking with you on a platform where other people can hear it. Cause it just, to even be in that type of lineup, it, it's very humbling. So well, thank you, Jim. I really appreciate the opportunity. Hey, man, I appreciate the kind words. And uh, it, really, this is uh, this is fire, dude. I'm stoked. Like, I, I can't wait to get this up. People are just going to, yeah, this is good. This is real good. Thanks, bro. I appreciate it. It could be wildfire in a negative way, too, so good luck. Hey, man, <laughs> you know what? It, 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 call me the Lannisters because this is, this, is the, <laughs> this is the right fire right here, bro. All right, man. We'll catch up real soon, buddy. I appreciate the time. Hey, Jay. Thank you, buddy. Yeah, man. And a huge thank you to Stanford Basketball Sport Performance Coach Corey Schlesinger for sitting down and talking with us today. Guys, awesome stuff. Fantastic stuff. Open, honest, candid sharing, talking about everything from where his ideas come from to how they implement them. Corey, I can't thank you enough for taking the time with us today. This was absolutely fantastic. Guys, if you did enjoy the talk, as always, please share it through the social media outlet of your choice. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever it may be. And also, if you enjoyed the talk, smash that like button on YouTube, iTunes, Podomatic, whichever it is. And if you haven't subscribed, please go ahead and do so. And if you've got about 5, 10 seconds and wouldn't mind leaving us a review on any of those outlets, we would greatly appreciate it. And as always, guys, thank you for everything you do for us here at Central Virginia Sport Performance. We will be back next week with another awesome guest. We will see you then.